All right, now we're going to go to, look, I have electricity, woo. Now we're going to go to slide 33 and start with hypothyroidism. I'm gonna to try to get everything done super fast in the third part of this video because then we're gonna to have to do the next chapter as well. So lots of videos, so I apologize. Every time someone calls my phone, it throws the video off. Look at this hair, look at this hair. All right, hypothyroidism on slide 33. And page 847 in your book. Um, hypothyroidism can be caused by inflammation of the thyroid gland that damages tissue, iodine deficiency, decreased TSH secretion, hypothalamus dysfunction, atrophy of the thyroid gland, or by treatment of hyperthyroidism. Hyper <coughs> and that's how your uh, uh, book starts out with hypothyroidism. So remember when we're talking about the thyroid, we always want to think about um, metabolism, excuse me, metabolism. So you've got to think about people here that are kind of going low and slow, all right? In hyperthyroidism, we were talking about um, hyper people, well, not hyper people, but it would be more look like a hyper metabolism and hypo, we're going to think of more of a lower metabolism. And we know, probably know a lot of people out in the world that have hypo thyroidism and they take supplements or hormones or whatever it is, um, replacement, that's what we're going to call it, replacement therapy for the um, thyroid hormone to help bring it back up to a normal level. Now, to talk about these things again, it talks about the way that you can get hypothyroidism. I really want to focus on a couple of those. So remember, we've got our pituitary gland that produces TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. And that causes a stimulation of my thyroid to produce its hormones, T3 and T4. All right. And those are the ones that keep us balanced. But if we didn't have TSH coming from our uh, pituitary gland, then it would not, my, my thyroid would not be stimulated to make its uh, hormones itself. So I actually need the correct production of TSH which then will stimulate my thyroid to produce T3 and T4, and that's my circulating hormones that keep my thyroid working correctly. So I can have a problem in a couple of places here, just like I could with hyperthyroidism. And I know last night's video, I was trying to get through a little bit faster because I had no power, but today we can talk about that. So I can have a problem with my TSH either way, all right, either I'm overproducing or underproducing the TSH, in hypothyroidism, I would be underproducing, and that would cause my thyroid not to be stimulated to make enough T3 and T4. Or I can have the problem right at my thyroid, okay? So my thyroid could just not be functioning correctly, and that could be a cause of some of these other reasons here, um, infection, inflammation, tissue damage, whatever it may be. But for those reasons, I'm not getting enough T3 and T4, which kind of determine what my metabolism is doing. Now, your book talks about something that happens with genetic effects in hypothyroidism. It talks about creatinism. It's so hard to say. Have you ever heard the term, you're a cretin? So, this would be cretinism. There you go. There's the term. That's the word I'm looking for. And this can happen in utero. And this can happen um, to a, um, in a congenital type problem where the fetus doesn't have the thyroid hormones that it needs. So then you've got a child that has stunted growth because they couldn't uh, grow correctly in utero, and um, people might have, you know, growth failure and have lots of problems that come from that. But that would be in utero. Most times we don't see that. Most of the time we see hypothyroidism maybe a, a little bit later in life. And that can be caused by numerous things like with the inflammation or just a problem with the thyroid itself not producing the T3 and T4. Um, it does talk about, in your book, uh, signs and symptoms. It says children with hypothyroidism have delayed physical and mental growth, and we talked about that. That's the one that's cretinism. Um, and it says maybe very sluggish within a few weeks after birth. And then they need to start looking at the thyroid. But again, that's not the typical one we see. Older people that we see, or people who are not children or infants, we see with hypothyroidism, we think about symptoms that would suggest a lower metabolism. You might have cold intolerance, constipation because peristalsis is not moving as fast, it's sluggish, abdominal distension from gas, uh, flatulence, which is gas, impaired memory, depression, husky voice, 
Thinning eyebrows, hair loss, brittle nails, easy bruising, fatigue, muscle cramps, numbness and tingling, dry skin, which is a very important one, and non-pitting edema. So these people are kind of more, uh, sometimes maybe a little bit plumper. Now, I've seen plenty of slimmer people that have hypothyroidism, um, but typically speaking, then you might have someone who has problems losing weight and they can't figure out why. They stay cold all the time, all right? Um, thinning hair is a big one and the dry skin. So you're real, those are really probably the biggest ones when it comes to hypothyroidism. To diagnose it, they're gonna be doing tests to look to see if you're producing enough TSH or if you're producing enough T3, T4 by blood tests. Um, so uh, that's probably gonna be your biggest one. And that's usually how everybody gets diagnosed. So I think that's what we should focus on is just the blood testing. And they're just going to draw your hormone levels just to see your T3, T4 levels and your TSH levels to see where the problem is. Okay. Now, they should be drawing all three, TSH, T3, and T4, because the problem could be either place. Nursing management, it talks about people with chronic hypothyroidism have very rough and dry skin, and they will need massage with lotions and creams to prevent cracking and peeling of the skin. We know when your skin cracks and peels, then we have a portal for infection. So we definitely want to prevent that. Um, people who are sensitive to cold, make sure they're dressing in layers. You do have on page 848, patient teaching that is very important. You need to read over the patient teaching. Okay, I'm actually gonna make a mark in my book. All right, I also want you to pay attention to the safety alert. Um, at the bottom of the, uh, on that same page, talking about um, the change in thyroid medicines. Thyroid medicine should be um, taken as prescribed, and when it goes to the pharmacies, it really should be filled in uh, n the name and the dosage that the doctor wants, of course. And it talks about a little bit in here how you get generic drugs, and then maybe a slight variance in the hormone, and that can be dangerous. So, however your doctor writes it should be how the pharmacy fills it. Um, we're not going to cover my exdemia coma. That's not something you see a lot, so we won't test on that. So go to slide 35, thyroiditis. Thyroiditis, of course, anything that ends in itis is inflammation. So this is inflammation of your thyroid, and it can happen a few different ways. Your book says acute, such as if I get an infection. Uh, subacute related to another infection. So for some reason, my thyroid got inflamed because I had an infection somewhere else. Or chronic, which is the most common type, and that's an autoimmune problem. And we call that Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And in autoimmune problems with your thyroid, of course, we know autoimmune attacks its own self. So in this situation, your body is attacking its own thyroid. And the signs and symptoms, um, you're usually going to see a painless enlargement. And then you might have dysphagia because when you have anything that enlarges in the neck, it's going to be pushing on your trachea, which might make it hard to breathe, and your voice box. So it might be hard to swallow or breathe. So we want to make sure that we keep an eye on those people because that's a life-threatening situation. And for diagnosis, we're usually going to do a needle biopsy of the gland and check your TSH and uh, your um, iodine uptake levels. Remember, iodine is the protective nutrient, the protective chemical, not chemical, um, protective, well, it's what protects your thyroid, okay? I'm at a loss for words right now. Uh, mineral, it is the protective mineral that, uh, for your thyroid. So, we're really looking at that iodine uptake too to see how that's doing. Uh, treatment for thyroiditis is to give hormonal supplementation to prevent the hypothyroidism and suppress the TSH secretion. Uh, thyroid function in this disorder is usually normal or low rather than increased as acute thyroiditis. So for your immune thyroiditis is what we're focusing on. Then I'm going to treat to make sure to, to treat the hypothyroidism and suppress the TSH secretion. It also says we can do surgery to remove part of the gland. That could be considered. And you really want, you're probably going to see questions about having any kind of neck surgery. You could see those on the NCLEX. And what's important about the neck surgeries is that you're really watching airway. You're making sure that they're sitting up. You're watching for bleeding, clearing their throat, which could be bleeding down the back of their throat. Okay, really important you're paying attention to those things about neck surgery. Thyroid cancer we'll cover in the cancer chapter. So we're now we're going to go to slide 38. <coughs> Hypoparathyroidism. 
Now, your parathyroids sit on either side of your thyroid. So usually when we have a problem with hypoparathyroidism, it's because there was damage during thyroid surgery. Because they sit on either side of the thyroid, it would be easy to cause a problem there. So usually that's our problem. Um, we're going to see that this happens because we're going to have a huge drop in serum calcium levels. So we're really looking at problems here. That's going to be our first notification if we see problems that go along with um, hypocalcemia. Um, it says, and when we think about calcium too, we're also going to think about phosphorus because calcium and phosphorus are invertly related. So if my calcium goes up, my phosphorus goes down. If my phosphorus goes up, my calcium goes down. So in this situation with my calcium dropping, my phosphorus would go up. So I definitely would look at my calcium level and my phosphorus level. Really pay attention to your signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia because that's our big problem in hypoparathyroidism. And that's usually going to be muscle problems. So we're going to have mild tingling, numbness, muscle cramps, mental changes such as irritability. Make sure you're really looking at a checkoff sign and trousseau sign, Chavs Tech, excuse me, Chavs Tech sign and trousseau sign. Um, uh, Chavs Tech sign is a facial nerve. When I tap the facial nerve, there's some irritability. Um, Muscle irritability and trousseau sign was when I put a blood pressure cuff around your arm and I blow it up and then I have some carpal issues where I start to bend my um, wrist in. And those are good ways to check for hypocalcemia. The, and that would be tetany. Tetany, of course, goes along with that those muscle problems. Um, it also says here convulsions, cardiac dysrhythmias, and spasms of the larynx. Um, really watch for your cardiac dysrhythmias because your heart is a muscle. And remember when we're looking at low calcium, we're looking at muscle problems. A diagnosis for hypoparathyroidism is observed by the clinical signs. What I'm seeing, I can do an electrocardiogram of the heart if I have some disturbances in my heart. And I can do a, key, a CT scan to reveal if there's any brain calcifications because of the hypocalcemia. It says changes in bone integrity may be seen on a radiograph. Remember, I need calcium for bone growth and bone stability, so I can see that on a bone scan. And I can also look at my serum calcium level, my total protein, my albumin, my phosphate, magnesium, vitamin D, and my parathyroid hormone. The big ones you need to take out of that are calcium and vitamin D and your parathyroid hormone and your phosphate. Remember, phosphorus and calcium, invertly related, and vitamin D and calcium have to play together to work. So definitely looking at your calcium and your vitamin D, looking at your phosphorus, and looking at your parathyroid hormone. Treatment is to give IV calcium gluconate to raise the serum calcium levels to normal range. It says we could do this oral or parenteral administration of calcium salts is used in the acute phase in chronic hypoparathyroidism. Treatment is aimed at restoring and maintaining normal calcium by parathyroid hormone replacement. Um, we might have to give vitamin D because remember vitamin D and calcium have to play together to work correctly. So I'm really looking at replacement of the calcium, possibly replacement of the hormone of my parathyroid and vitamin D to play with the calcium. Hyperparathyroidism, um, also called, uh, this is a great one. Von Reckenschlagen disease. I'm pretty sure I probably didn't say that right. All right, but hyperparathyroidism. It's an endocrine disorder most common in postmenopausal women. Very uh, big cue to remember that there, postmenopausal women, due to the loss of bone protection from estrogen. Um, it's having excessive synthesis and secretion of the parathyroid hormone, parathor actually parathormone, parathyroid hormone, can occur typically as a result of benign enlargement of the parathyroid glands or hyperplasia of two or more of the glands. This one, of course, will going to be a little bit, is going to be opposite of the hypoparathyroidism. So we're going to have hypercalcemia, too much calcium. And it occurs with hyperactivity of the parathyroid because the hormone pulls calcium out of the bones. So remember back in AMP when you're talking about calcium, you've got blood calcium, you've got bone calcium, and my bones and my blood have to work together so that if I have too much calcium in my blood, then it goes back to be reabsorbed in my bone. If I don't have enough in my blood, then my bone sends calcium out to my blood. Well, in this situation uh, with hyperparathyroidism, I'm pulling the calcium out of the bone. So what do you think that might cause? 
some uh, bone fragility and brittle bones. Um, other causes of hyperparathyroidism are listed in box 36-2. You can look at those um, neck trauma or radiation. That's a big one to consider because if there's been neck trauma, remember we can have a problem with the if we've hurt that parathyroid hormone or parathyroid. <coughs> if there's been any harm to it, it can start to over-secrete its hormone. Vitamin D deficiency would be a big one because remember vitamin D and calcium have to play together to work correctly. So if I don't have enough vitamin D, then I've got a lot of free-floating calcium out there. A renal failure of hypocalcemia. My body recognizes that there's a low problem, so it starts to send out more calcium. But what we really want to focus on is just um, the problems, okay? Usually from the postmenopausal women. Um, let's see here. Signs and symptoms. Are we on this one? Yeah, we're still on the same slide. Um, we're going to see mild or severe symptoms, usually result in the dysfunction of other organs or tissues related to high calcium levels. Include dehydration, confusion, lethargy, arrhythmias. Again, remember calcium is related to muscle and your heart is a muscle. So I'm definitely going to see some, probably some dysrhythmias. Um, anorexia, which means I don't want to eat. I'm not hungry. Nausea, vomiting, weight loss, constipation, thirst, urination, and hypertension. Probably the biggest ones to remember there are your arrhythmias and hypertension. Um, usually it says down below, with, remember how we talked about that because I'm pulling calcium out of the bone, I'm going to have bone fragility. So these people are going to maybe see a bone fracture and that's going to cause them to go to the doctor. Like, how did I get this fracture? And they start digging deeper and they see that there's a, a parathyroid problem, a hyperparathyroid problem. We're going to diagnose it by lab testing, uh, elevated ser seeing an elevated serum calcium. And low phosphorus, again, calcium and phosphorus related. So if my calcium goes up, my phosphorus goes down. So I definitely want to check my calcium and my phosphorus levels and check my parathyroid hormones again. Just like before in hypoparathyroidism, checking those calcium, phosphorus, and phosphate and parathyroid hormones. Um, it talks about a DEXA in there, but we don't have to focus on that one. Just the labs right now. Um, let's see here. It also talks about serum albumin is also measured because serum calcium needs to be corrected for low albumin levels. Um, you would check albumin in hypoparathyroid as well, but right now what I want you to focus on is that inverse proportion to calcium and phosphorus and the parathyroid hormone. Treatment, treatment of hyperparathyroidism will depend on the severity. Um, infusions of isotonic sodium chloride and administration of diuretic agents promotes urine secretion of the extra calcium. <coughs> so I can cause you to go urinate and get rid of the extra calcium as well. I can give you phosphate therapy. If I give you phosphate and my phosphate levels go up, then it might drive my calcium levels down. And that will, that will if I drive my calcium levels down, then I won't be giving so much calcium off from my bone as well. 